Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me this morning for my daily Come Follow Me study of the Book of Mormon. It is Wednesday the 7th, and we're going to start with a daily reflection on the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> I looked and beheld a man among the Gentiles, and I beheld the Spirit of God, that it came down and wrought upon the man, and he went forth upon the many waters, even unto the seed of my brethren, who were in the promised land. First Nephi chapter 13, verse 12. More than 2,000 years before Columbus set sail, Nephi saw in vision the discovery and colonizing of the Americas, events that were vital to the restoration. Columbus acknowledged that the Holy Ghost inspired him on his journey, and the Lord gave him courage and understanding. President Ezra Taft Benson declared, The destiny of America was divinely decreed. The events which established our great nation were foreknown to God and revealed to prophets of old. As in an, as in an enacted drama, the players who came on the scene were rehearsed and selected for their parts. Their talents, abilities, capacities and weaknesses were known before they were born as one who looks back upon what we call our history there is a telling theme which recurs again and again in this drama it is that god governs in the affairs of this nation all things both globally and individually are known to him who is omniscient and eternal <clears throat> A very comforting thought in uh, in a political year. Okay, today is our general conference talk for charity. And what I did, I know that the you regulars know this, but what I did was I just went into the Gospel Library app. I went to general conference portion. I typed in charity. And I selected three talks that were in that section. I didn't read them beforehand. I just chose them um, usually on the four years. So 2014, 2004, 1994, 1984, 1974, if there were ones from those years. So that's what I chose. <clears throat> Today's talk is More Holiness Give Me by Bishop H. David Burton. And he begins to talk about financial more. He he talks about um, uh, the current conventional wisdom is that more is better and less is usually unde undesirable. For some, the pursuit to acquire more of this world's goods and services has become a passion for other, more of this world's wealth is necessary just to sustain life and raise living standards to a minimum level. Um, the unbridled desire for more often has tragic consequences. And he goes on and I was like, okay, is, is this about charity? Is this about compassion? And he talks to, he talks about parents. Parents who have success, who have been successful in acquiring more, often have a difficult time saying no to the demands of overindulged children. This I know to be true. Do I spoil the children? Rotten. Rotten. Alex, he's so spoiled. I need to get, I need to rein that in. But anyways, their children run the risk of not learning important values like hard work, delayed gratification. All three of the boys have a problem with delayed gratification honesty and compassion affluent parents can and do raise well-adjusted loving and value-centered children but the struggle to set limits make do with less and avoid the pitfalls of more 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 has never been more difficult it is hard to say no when more to more when you can afford to say yes and that's my problem i've never been able to say yes before i've never been able to afford to say yes before and I can afford to say yes and I say yes a lot um so it's hard to say no to more when you can afford to say yes so something I need to learn and you're like okay 
well, let's, where's the charity, blah, blah, blah. We're getting to it. Then he goes on to say uh, that fewer and fewer parents are asking their children to do chores because they think they're overwhelmed by social and academic pressures. But children devoid of responsibilities risk never learning that every individual can be of service and that life has meaning beyond their own happiness. That I want to take into me as the child and Heavenly Father as the parent. If I continually ask him to remove such trials or responsibilities from me, if I constantly just want to be the associate and not the manager... I'm going to, um, what does he say? I'm never going to learn that every individual can be of service and that life has meaning beyond their own happiness. Having responsibilities, learning to grow and stretch, having uh, different callings in the church, it's important for my progression. Um, with my ministering, I, I'm very bad at it. I don't do it with love. I do it because I've been asked to do it. That's like, and I'll shoot them a text. I'll send them a letter. It's very, I try to put my heart behind it, but like, I have no desire to become friends with these people. I don't want to go to their house and visit with them. It's so awkward for me. If anybody came here and tried to visit with me as my ministering sister, I'd be like, can you just go? Like, I, I'm is antisocial the right word? I, I don't want to. I never liked it when people came to the house. Even when I was in the single singles ward. I never liked it when people came to my house to visit with me. Uh, and it felt so. Contrived. or so. I, I, I don't like that thought. I don't. It doesn't come naturally to me. And maybe that's what this charity and compassion thing is going to do for me, is that I'm going to want to talk to people. I don't know. I just don't like it. I don't like it. So I send cards and I send text messages and, you know, I'll, I'll make them gifts and, you know, whatever. But it just feels so unnatural to me. So in my ministering... Um, one of my ministering sisters, she's having surgery and somebody asked me to bring her dinner. And I was like, yes, absolutely. I can do that. Um, but it feels like a chore. That's like, this is an opportunity for me to be charitable and compassionate and to give service. You know, February is all about service. Like, yes, I'm willing to do that, but it feels like a chore. It doesn't feel like something I want to do. I can do it. Absolutely. I can, like, I'm bringing her dinner, um, for her whole family. I can afford to do that. Absolutely. I can do that easy peasy, but it feels like a chore. I don't want service to feel like it. I don't know. Maybe I'll get there by the end of February. Maybe I'll get there by the end of my life. I don't know. But anyways, um, then he goes on to, talk about the charity portion. Okay. The meaning of more and less is not always crystal clear. There are times when less is in reality more and times when more can be less. For instance, less pursuit of materialism may enable more family togetherness. More indulgence of children may result in less understanding of life's important values. Some aspects of life can be significantly enhanced by the notion that more is better. The sacred hymn, More Holiness Give Me, uh, brings to our remembrance the virtues worthy of more of our attention. Jesus himself described what it requires to be more Savior like thee. He said, I would that ye should be perfect, even as I or your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Meekness is vital. Meekness is vital to becoming more Christ-like. Without it, one cannot develop other important virtues. Mormon indicated, none is acceptable before God save the meek and lowly in heart. Acquiring meekness is a process. We are asked to take up the daily cross. Our lifting should not be an occasional exercise. 
more meekness does not translate to weakness, but it is the present but it is the presentation of self in a posture of kindness and gentleness. It reflects certitude, strength, serenity. It reflects a healthy self-esteem and a genuine self-control. More meekness will allow us to be tutored by the Spirit. All of that is fantastic. That came from Neil A. Maxwell. He was quoting him, uh, meekly drenched in destiny in a Brigham Young University fireside in 1982, 1983. Um, here, our lifting should not be an occasional exercise. This brings me to the compassion book. All of it's going to be mixed together today, okay? This brings me to the compassion book. In this, the chapter... Five, loving those who are different from us. Um, there's, uh, he tells a story about his daughter. They went to a festival and his daughter saw um, a bunch of beggars and one was a little girl who was freezing cold and dripping rain. And without hesitation, his little daughter gave this girl her coat. Um, uh, but there's something I wanted to read in here. It says, feelings of compassion are often awakened in times of great need, but when these feelings are awakened, it is because they are already within us. It is because of the divinity that ex exists within us, children of Heavenly Father, who is the ultimate giver of compassion. President Marion G. Romney taught, the truth is, my beloved brethren and sisters, man is a child of God, a God in embryo. These feelings of compassion are ingrained in our very spiritual makeup but we don't always use our free will in the way that motivates action for good our daughter had already been taught about charity and other principles of the gospel on that day she actively experienced for herself this godly attribute upon seeing the young girl in great need she had a choice she could have chosen to look in another direction or she could have done as she did and risen to the occasion when we utilize these divine attributes by our faithful actions and not solely in empty and trite words, the word compassion will be engraven in our mind and heart and a delightful and desirable mark that will remain in us forever. This mark in our heart will be one of the attributes that truly identifies us as divine offspring of our compassionate and loving Heavenly Father. We read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, And it doth not yet appear that we shall be what we shall be, but we know that we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And during this mortal sojourn, when, we, when an experience evokes this attribute, innate and godlike inclinations within us are awakened. We desire to do good. It is in everyday life that we learn and share lessons of divine love and compassion that last within us. These moments are the true training for eternal life. We'll come back to this. While reading this, I was, he's saying it's ingrained in my DNA that charity and compassion come naturally to me. As I was reading it, I was like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't come naturally to me. It does with those who I love. I'm extremely compassionate to those who I care about. You want or need something, you got it. It's yours. I'll do anything I can to help you because I love you. To those who I don't know, to those around the world, like compassion does not come naturally to me to those who I don't have like firsthand experience with when um, they're talking about refugees. I have no emotions whatsoever. I should because they're going through a very difficult, hard time. If I learned a little bit more about what they're going through, maybe. I don't know. It's just what he was talking about, I felt the opposite. I'm like, yeah, for any one of my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, I'll go to the ends of the earth for. For my friends, anything you need, you've got it. What's mine is yours and you want more? Okay, wait a couple of days, I get a paycheck, you can have more. 
but anybody who I don't know, I'm like, like you see some, I see somebody begging on the street. Sorry, bro. That's your own fault. No compassion whatsoever. Um, but here he's saying our lifting should not be an occasional exercise. Meekness does not translate to weakness, but it is in the presentation of self in a posture of kindness and gentleness. It reflects certitude strength, serenity. It reflects a healthy self-esteem and a genuine self-control. I guess that's what I'm trying to learn this year is to be more like the Savior, is to um, restrain genuine self-control. He goes on, the virtues expressed in more holiness give me fall into several groups. Some are personal goals, like more holiness give me, more striving within, more faith, gratitude, and purity. More fit for the kingdom, more purpose in prayer, and more trust in the Lord. Others center on adversity. They include patience in suffering, meekness in trial, praise for relief, strength to overcome, freedom from earth stains, and longing for home. The rest firmly anchor us to our Savior, more sense of his care, more pride in his glory, more hope in his word, more joy in his service, more tears for his sorrow, more pain at his grief, more blessed and holy, more savior like thee. More of these virtues is better, less is not desirable. Clearly, I have some, I mean, clearly I have some work to do. Clearly, without a doubt, um... And I'm going to end with his words. Well, I'm going to close his talk. And then we're going to go back to compassion. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I am. Okay. So he says, I'm not discuss. I'm not suggesting that parents adopt a Scrooge role um, as a good modeling for parenting. I am suggesting that it is important for families and individuals to aggressively seek more of the virtues which go beyond this mortal life. A prayerful, conservative approach is the key to successfully living in an affluent society and building the qualities that come from waiting, sharing, saving, working hard, and making do with what we have. May we be blessed with the desire and the ability to understand when more is really less and when more is better. Um aggressively seek more of the virtues clearly I need to be more aggressive so at work I'm noticing the instances in the in the morning when I wake up I pray that Heavenly Father will take me by the hand and show me instances where compassion is needed to teach me compassion to uh, help me love my fellow men I I envision him holding me by the hand and walking me through my day. That's what I'm praying for every morning. And at work, it is so, so hard. It is so hard. Yesterday, especially, lots of stress coming at me because of like two different claims that's going on. And when people have a problem with a the package, they get aggressive. And it's really hard to be calm and there were many, many times where, for instance, a customer comes in, they do their thing, they're a little bit rude or snippy or whatever, and then we all stand there and we wait for the person to walk out the door and the door closes, and then we turn to each other and we're like, oh my gosh, blah, 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 blah. Literally, that happens constantly. And there were several times yesterday where I wanted to say, you know, I'm trying to be charitable, so I'm not going to say anything about that person. I want those words wanted to come out of my mouth so many times, but I held it in because Heavenly Father was there. He was holding my hand and he was like, charity is not saying that you wanted to say something. Just hold your tongue. That's charity. So like work is making it difficult. It's a, it feels like it's a natural desire. It feels like it's ingrained in my DNA to not be compassionate. And we're going to carry on in the compassion book. Um, when we choose, oh, and then he goes on to forgiveness. 
Um, he talks about how forgiveness is an act of compassion. Um, we learn through the scriptures that the Savior taught about forg what the Savior taught about forgiv forgiving, that we are required to forgive all men. When we choose not to forgive others, we become chained by bitterness and anger. This is a heavy burden on us, and it may cause us to lose the influence of the Spirit in our lives. We cannot repent for the mistakes of other people make, but we can forgive them. In so doing, we can free ourselves of being someone's judge. We surrender to the Lord, and we stop carrying this heavy burden ourselves. Nurturing negative feelings in our hearts is a roadblock to healing and ultimately to happiness. If we let these feelings go, the Savior can heal our hearts and can help us feel joy once again. The imagery here of when we choose to forgive someone, then we free ourselves of a heavy burden is kind of remarkable. When you carry around hurt feelings and okay so many thoughts are jumbled up in my head right now but when you carry around that hurt you're clearly it you're clearly weighed down you're not light you don't feel joy you're not happy I think we've all experienced that the Savior gave his life to separate us from our sins, giving us the power to turn away from our iniquities. In Moroni 10.8, it is recorded that we should not deny the gifts of God. When we choose not to forgive, in a sense, we are denying one of the most precious gifts of God, the gift of the Savior's atonement. Let's, let's live our life with real and focused intent. This is an important character trait for the great achievers in life. They keep persisting in the right direction, no matter the pressure or circumstance or distraction. This bit was very important to me last night as I was reading this. Uh, live our life with real and focused intent. My life is has been very passive. I just let whatever comes and I'll handle it in the moment and I have no plans for the future and you know what it what will be will be. I not laissez faire, but it's like I can't control everything and so heavenly father's going to do what heavenly father's going to do so why not just like live my life type thing, right? Just let the chips fall where they may, and then so on and so forth. But that has led me to foster these sort of lazy characteristics of not actively being compassionate, of feeling like this divine characteristic that's ingrained in my DNA as a spirit daughter of Heavenly Father, that compassion doesn't come naturally to me. Um, I clearly, I need to be more focused. I need to have real intent on choosing every day to develop these characteristics until they become natural to me. I've let this kind of passive sort of thing become my personality. Is that the right word? I don't know. But what I'm learning is that I've become lazy and not lazy in the sense that I don't work because I work very hard. Lazy in the sense that lazy in, in lazy in my actions, lazy in my reactions, lazy in my Lazy in my honey. I'm doing my video. She went to the storehouse. <sighs> Anyways, honey, I'm not done with my video. You need to leave. Anyways, a lot of wake up calls. <sighs> um, that was more holiness. Give me by Bishop H. David Burton. 
No, honey, I'm doing my video. What? Hannah still has candy in her bag. Well, you can't have candy. Go back upstairs. Okay, so for the general conference study portion of the video, or what we're going to talk about, it was How Great Will Be Your Joy by Elder Ronald A. Rasband. And this was a call to <laughs> senior missionaries. He was calling senior couples to like serve a mission and I was as I was listening because it was last night before bed and I was like oh my goodness I have so much reading to do before bed um I, I was listening to it and the whole time I'm like this isn't for me this isn't for me and as I'm going back and reading these talks I'm like maybe this general conference wasn't for me maybe that's why I didn't get anything out of it that maybe this general conference, October, wasn't for me. And that's okay. Um, next week we're going to read Ulysses S. Suarez, Brothers and Sisters in Christ. That's next week's. Okay. <sighs> Let's end with Alexander. You're about to get into timeout. Do you understand? You're being ridiculous. Okay. Let's leave with a read it, do it. 2 Nephi chapter 1, verses 20 through 27. They highlight verse 21. At the end of his life, Lehi gives some last advice. Be determined, be of one mind and one heart. Put on the armor of righteousness. Shake off the chains with which ye, you are bound. <coughs> and they tell us to choose one. To be determined. I think that's mine. To be determined. Be determined to express charity today. Be determined to have Heavenly Father hold me by the hand. Teach me charity. Like, bring out this natural divine attribute that is ingrained in me. Bring it out. Because it's not there. I've suppressed it so much. Okay. That was everything. Tomorrow is Second Nephi chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. We will see you then. Talk to you later. Bye.